your housing may be in trouble to put in uh, less colorful terms. Uh, our next guest is going to explain why Michael Gayet is a portfolio manager of the Title Financial Group. Michael, always an honor hosting you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, yeah, let's, thank you for killing it on YouTube, by the way. You're absolutely uh, crushing it. Just do my best. Do my best, Michael. It's because a great guest like you that we have a good program. You've been tweeting uh, very colorful things <laughs> about the housing market, which I can't really repeat in full on YouTube, unfortunately. But the message stands that our housing market is in trouble. And I think you're losing the lumber price as an indicator. Tell us about that. Well, and now it's not just lumber. It's also, you know, you're seeing it from the things that Home Depot uh, is saying, right? So, uh, look, I, I, I've been on broken record on this, but it's it's – not an opinion. It is fact. I've put research on it. There is predictive power there. Average home is 16,000 board feet of lumber. Lumber is at uh, multi-year lows, has been continuously cratering. Uh, and yes, while home builder stocks seemingly look strong, uh, home builder stocks don't seem to be predictive of very much, whereas lumber tends to be because of what it signals for demand. So uh, I, I suspect that uh, you're going to see some real uh, significant slowdowns happening in the housing market. Now, I've been saying this for some time, right? For over the last year when lumber started, you know, uh, peaking uh, and going down. The thing is, like, there are lags with this stuff, right? Somebody tweeted at me saying, respect the lag, right? So uh, housing hasn't mattered very much for the broader market. Everyone's focused on commercial real estate. Everyone's focused on debt ceiling. All those are also risks, but as I keep saying, nothing matters until it matters. And then when it matters, it's the only thing that matters. If lumber is right that housing is in trouble, uh, everything's in trouble. But uh, Michael, walk us through the transmission mechanism here, because you, you've got lumber prices falling, but it doesn't necessarily mean that contractors and the builders are going to start charging less right away, correct? Well, but, that, but it, it's a reflection of demand, right? The fact that lumber is not uh, getting any kind of a bid would suggest that there's not any sort of expectation that you're going to see housing activity pick up anytime soon. And that lag is going to hit around the spring summer periods where you tend to have a lot more housing construction and activity. Listen, housing makes up 18 to 20% of GDP. So if you're going to have, uh, if, if lumber's message around demand is correct, uh, then housing activity is going to slow down pretty meaningfully. Now, some will say that, okay, sure, but inventory is still very tight. So, you're not going to have increased uh, housing activity, uh, which would make inventory even tighter. My problem with that argument is that people seemingly forgot that for the last decade, you've had uh, all these people buying up second, third, fourth properties to Airbnb. Well, suddenly, if all those Airbnb properties now, which were mortgaged, aren't generating income because all these high rates start to bite into the consumer like it looks like it's happening, well, guess what? Uh, there's going to be a huge influx of inventory coming down the line. Have you looked at which areas in the U.S., which cities, jurisdictions will most likely be impacted? Because I understand that not all real estate is equal. No, but what I would say is that, look, I get it. The argument is always that uh, housing is regional, right? It's like, all right, well, it's regional until it's systemic. Now, I'm not arguing that you have a 2008 type of collapse by any means, but you know, housing is, is, is a big driver for consumer confidence, right? So if if the message of lumber is that demand for home construction in, and and uh, and building is going to falter in a big way, then that's going to have a big impact on anybody that's involved in the housing industry, and that it matters far more than uh, the sentiment of those yoloing into Tesla or Apple or whatever it would be or some meme coin. I mean, this is ultimately what far more important for uh, sentiment than what you see on the screen, right? I mean, the irony about about sentiment and pricing uh, driving sentiment is that it's the part of the economy which is the least actively priced, which is home values, because it's based on comps, that has the biggest impact on how we feel about where do we spend and how much do we spend. Do you think that the lumber price going down was a reaction to certain macro events, or do you think it was just overbought? Yeah, no, there's, there's no question the sawmill disruptions you know, were a big part of that. But I, I don't know why it's such a surprise to a lot of people. It's like, we, you saw tremendous activity post-COVID. I mean, a lot of things were pulled forward as far as activity and, and home construction. So, you know, I think the it makes sense that you would see demand really kind of falter conceivably in a big way. Now, what I would say is that it's more than just lumber, right? Part of the research that I put out shows that when lumber is weak, small caps are weak. Well, guess what? That's happening. Part of the research shows that when lumber is weak, consumer stocks are weak. Well, guess what? That's happening too. Retailer stocks, weak. All the areas which are most sensitive to the consumer 
are confirming the message of lumber. Housing prices have not yet fully responded. They're starting to. My contention is that once housing starts to react to everything else around it, you know, that's where you might have a tail event that could affect stocks. Home Depot plunges after worst revenue missed in 20 years, slashes guidance, blames weather, lumber, and faltering consumer. We're seeing this happening across the board, though, right? Is it per- is it happening particularly badly in the uh, home renovations and, I guess, home improvement sector? Yeah, I think, I think so again, again, this is what pe- people are not understanding this aspect of lags, right? So um, whatever happens in the next three, four months to consumer uh, and activity, uh, lumber is already probably priced in you know, because it's warning about it. It's a leading indicator, right? Because it takes, you know, some some lead time for lumber to actually be used in home construction and for it to have an impact on consumer wealth. So I think broadly speaking, we're in a high risk period where housing could be a problem. I don't think it's going to be like 2006 peak where it started breaking down, leading to another great financial crisis, but it's going to be, you know, conceivably a pretty big uh, headwind. Now you combine that with concerns around debt ceiling, complacency, regional bank dynamics still taking place. Yeah, as much as I've been saying throughout the start, the start of the year, I think this is a melt up type of environment that's going to be a very volatile one. You, I can clearly see a scenario where you can have a really nasty sudden decline because all these things are taking place and nobody seems to care, at least for now. And when they do care, uh, suddenly it becomes pretty violent. So bottom line for housing is that you don't think it's going to be as bad as 2008, but uh, we still have to be worried about what the indicators are telling us. Recall that in 2007, the housing price was already rolling over. You know, 2008 was not the impetus of a housing market correction. It made it worse, <laughs> but it was already rolling over. We're starting to see that now with the Case Shiller Index, right? Can you comment on that? Yeah, and that's the point. It takes time, right? So it, it, housing peaked in 2006, right? Like a full two years before Lehman, right? So, you know, these things take time to to play out. But I, again, I would caution people to be overly excited about risk on assets. If I guess for the be, uh, for the average consumer, what do we do with this information? Yeah. <laughs> I can't sell my home right now because yeah, I'll no, be homeless. I get it. I, get it. <laughs> I mean, listen, they, they, you know, people might, might try to get ahead of it, if, especially if they're leveraged because of second, third properties, right? Conceivably, they could start selling out in advance. But I think it's just kind of a bigger issue as far as just where are we are in the cycle. It's like, you know, for those that are ultra, ultra bullish um, from a multi-year perspective, I'd caution their uh, optimism, uh, caution them on their optimism. All that means is, you know, don't assume that you can leverage up and YOLO into stocks like you did before uh, if housing is going to be a, a tailwind, uh, a headwind rather, uh, for all risk assets. Tell us about the relationship between the housing market and consumer spending. Yeah, I mean, well, this is the thing about everybody talking about the wealth effect. It's like everyone says the wealth effects about the S&P and the stock market. It's not. I mean, the Fed itself did studies on this. The wealth effect is about housing, right? So to, exactly to your point, if uh, the average consumer sees that their comps on Zillow are going down uh, because of recent transactions, they're going to be a little bit more cautious. There's going to be credit contraction as, as a result. The, the the amazing thing is that this is all happening with consumers also themselves highly leveraged. Right? And this is why I think this is actually quite tricky, right? And why you could have sort of a, a sudden surge in inventory. If you've got very levered players, the starting point is very high leverage. Lumber is right about a slowdown in housing. Suddenly, these uh, these vacation properties are not generating income. There's you could see a setup where there's almost like panic selling at the, on the periphery, right? If buy these properties, that would then mark down everything else. It's like a it's almost like a butterfly effect type of dynamic. So, um, and again, I go back to a lot of other parts of the marketplace are screaming this now. If regional banks also keep on being problematic which it seems like they still are. A lot of people are trying to bottom fish, but again, there are lags in terms of the credit contraction that's happening from the regional bank uh, turmoil. All that just means it's the same message. It's going to be a very challenging environment for risk on. Uh, and if that's the case, inflation probably breaks faster. And by the way, inflation needs housing to break. And just to clarify, these indicators you're looking at, including lumber, do they they're only talking about the residential market. Are you are you looking at the commercial real estate side at all, Michael? I, I, w- I will I will hold back my colorful language on uh, commercial real estate, but but you're you're hitting on something. Is I had I, you know I do these Twitter spaces. I had uh, Dan McNamara on Lee Lag Live, and it's true. Uh, there is some real risk when it comes to commercial real estate by side. Now a lot of things are priced in in the office, you know, on the side of things. Uh, but you know, y- you do have. This this sort of 
rolling uh, crisis di- dilemma, right? Where you conceivably have a lot of these properties, which are very leveraged, they're not all going to mature uh, on the leverage at the same time, right? And uh, again, all that means is that you're going to have ongoing risks. It's very hard to refinance and to re-leverage if you have less banks and if you have <laughs> banks not wanting to uh, provide capital because they're worried about their own uh, asset liability mismatches. So yes, that that is a big problem. Now that's not all doom and gloom because you can still have obviously markets and equities do what they do. They can go up, they can go down. But I keep going back to all that means for those listening is that the conditions simply don't favor being overly, overly optimistic. We're probably in a low return environment for risk assets for a while. And, you know, you got to stay vigilant in terms of being overly convinced on the bull argument. Uh, Janet Yellen came out yesterday using stronger language than you. <laughs> There's no way she uses stronger language than me. Well, no, I, I don't mean in terms of vocabulary. I mean in terms of scaring the nation. Oh, boy. <laughs> what does she say exactly? Let me pull up a quote. Uh, we have learned from past debt limit impasses that waiting until the last minute to suspend or increase the debt limit can cause serious harm to business and consumer confidence, raise short-term borrowing costs for taxpayers, and negatively impact the credit rating of the United States. They have two weeks. Let's talk about that. <laughs> they have two weeks. Well, you pretty much just scared me by saying they have two weeks because you're, ex- and she's probably right on that. Look, they're gonna, they're gonna, of course, they're gonna pat, they're gonna lift it. I mean, they, they always do. It's, it's like I used that line many times before. The end of the world is the bull case. I mean, that's end of the world type of scenario if, if you know, the U.S. breaks down. But having said that, can can you have unintended consequences? Can you still have risk? You know, from them messing around and playing with the rhetoric uh, unequivocally because again, the system is so levered, right? So, um, yeah, it's. It, I do think it's risk. And if you look, you you see the same charts I see on credit default swaps. It's like. There is some betting that there's a black swan event out there, right? And it seemed, and it, it is remarkable. The, the price on credit default swaps is higher than the 2011 uh, debt debacle. It's higher than, uh, last I checked, it was higher than the 2008, 2009, or was getting near to it. Re- remember so, yeah. the 2011 debt debacle, the stock markets were cratering during that? I remember that year. I was in college. I was studying that. That was Why a is it not phenomenal cr- year for, for what I do. It's, it's this thing, it's like in 2011, you had, uh, the, 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 the amazing dynamic about 2011 was that Debt, debt, debt got downgraded by S&P, right? Stocks cratered three weeks. In three weeks, they're down. The S&P was down like 17%, right? Complete crash. I, I called it back then the summer crash of 2011. And then uh, at, the, at the same time, by the way, flight to safety, Phoenix rising dynamic kicks in. Long duration treasuries, TLT as a proxy goes up like 20% as stocks are going down 17. So you have this huge spread suddenly. And it's like, well, why would long duration yields fall with a debt downgrade because of the debt ceiling? Because the US government owns all of us, which means that if their credit quality sucks, Everybody's credit quality sucks because they own us through taxation. It's like what's so insane about the way people think about this stuff. They think, oh, you know, the, the U.S. you know should should uh, should should not pass the debt ceiling uh, here. Uh, okay, if you don't pass the debt ceiling, we're all in a lot of trouble. You have to deal with this in advance, not when there's two weeks to come. Um, you put all this together. What are we getting the recession? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards, like the uh, NBER <laughs> does uh, after it's already started, because you don't know until until you're in it. So, so a couple of things. First of all, what are the, the markers of recession? What typically happens on average? The majority of the time, what happens during a recession? The majority of the time when you're in a recession, you're below a two-day moving average. That's a marker. The majority of the time when you're in a recession, utilities are outperforming. That's a marker. Lumber to gold is weak. That's a marker. Long-duration treasuries are, are rallying against intermediate. That's a marker. All this relates to the research around Volatility dynamics, uh, interest rates, recessions, and leading indicators of risk. So, you know, I, I think when you start seeing all of those things line up, and I suspect it might happen sooner than later, that probably would suggest the market thinks where the recession has started. But you know, like you correctly said before, right? It's like, what do what do listeners do with that information? The truth is, not very much. All it means is you have to diversify into things that can benefit from you know, a more volatile environment. Now, the dollar was the beneficiary of volatility last year. Treasury is not so. Treasury is probably, and, and at least I hope, that's I need it for my own funds because that's the that risk off expression. Hopefully treasury is counter, you know, and provide some diversification benefits. Gold hopefully keeps doing what it's doing, which is diverge and counter. Um, you know, utilities outperformance if you're going to be in equities, right? Defensive sector, staples, healthcare, utilities. So it's more, it's less a question of sort of, you know, making a directional bet. It's more about, you know, diversifying and adding more to things that are not purely related to an expansionary environment. And you only have a couple of plays on that. Gold seems to be the one that's getting the most attention. I suspect treasuries will be the Phoenix that rises whenever that recession really kicks in in a big way. 
Well, last time we spoke, you were predicting a melt up by the end of the year. Do you still hold that view? Uh, I, uh, yes, I think we're in a melt up year because it's a pre election year. I keep going back to that point. But again, as I keep saying, you can have corrections in pre election years too. And I keep going back to that same example. In 1987, the Dow was up 37, 38%. 1987, you had the crash of 87. 1987, you had a Fed pivot. 1987, you had uh, the Dow still close positive, uh, but there was a hell of a lot of volatility. Uh, and that was a pre-election year too. So I'm not saying that we're going to exactly mimic 1987, but to think that you can't have you know, a correction, which I think started the third week of April. As I keep saying that on and on on Twitter. People keep countering me, but all the intermarket analysis would suggest that. The correction has started uh, third week of April. Some kind of bottom that might happen. I think maybe we could retouch the October lows. That's why I keep tweeting October. Um, and then another surge higher before a credit event. Yeah, that's how you can have a melt up for a moment in time with still the pre-election dynamics still in play. This is about sequence of returns, not a prediction. I was looking at a chart. I'll put a chart on the screen later. The um, the timing of which assets you should buy and when. So usually uh, in the past, if you average the recessionary cycles, uh, equities tend to do well after the economy troughs, which is to say that after the, uh, the recession is over. And then it rebounds. Uh, treasuries tend to do well before a recession hits. And I think that's how your position, right? That's how I would frame it, right? I mean, my, my strategies are, are very, very short term. So, But you're correct in terms of the average sort of positioning. All right. Well, uh, where can we find out more about your work? Uh, so you've got a fantastic Twitter space. And then um, we everyone should check out the lead leg report on Twitter. I'll put a link in the description below. But to learn more about your funds as well, where, where can we go and uh, the lead leg report itself? Yeah, I mean, atechfunds.com, which is separate from the content that I put out, that's rules-based funds. You know, Roro in the one, is the one that got hit the most last year. Uh, it's the one that's getting the most uh, traction so far this year. The, the the regional bank crisis, I think, did spark the, the return of the flight to safety dynamic of treasuries. So if I'm right that that dynamic is there, all that means is that these strategies, these funds have a chance, which is the most honest thing any fund manager can say in any kind of sales and marketing pitch – that their strategies have a chance with the right environment. I think the environment is very different from last year. And if I'm right on that, people would be surprised. They can be very surprised by how risk-on, risk-off approaches, rotating equities, treasuries uh, can perform if you have the right sequence. 2011, uh, if you look up the Roro Index, uh, was a hell of a year for that strategy. Um, we'll see if it repeats. Good analysis either way. Thank you very much, Michael, for your time today. You understand this. <laughs> But Michael Gallardo, follow him. And thank you for watching the David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more.